Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our members of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position along with your favorite beverage to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine our show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion, we want to say thanks for questions coming from our audience at Smith Weekly, including Nick W., Edward S., Paul M., and Michael N. Mr. Christian Malau is on the show today with us. Christian is the Chief Executive Officer of Equinox Gold, a growth gold producer with a focus on projects in the Americas. Equinox has a number of operating mines and development projects throughout Brazil, Mexico, California, United States, and Canada. Equinox Gold is a position held within our Opportunities Portfolio at Smith Weekly Research. The company is listed on the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol EQX and also on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the symbol EQX. Mr. Malau, thanks for coming back to talk to us. How are you? Yeah, great to be back. Uh, it's been a while and uh, like I was saying, we're back into a more of a normal world these days. So uh, nice to be talking about the business instead of other things. Absolutely. No, it's a bit refreshing here, and I hope we'll we'll keep the trend moving in that direction. Well, let's uh, kick it off here with a little bit of broad market and natural resource market discussion. What are your thoughts on how gold acts going forward? And do you believe that the natural resource markets, as they have so far this year, generally disconnect from the broad market, Christian, similar to a 2002 type scenario? Or do you see that natural resources could get dragged down with the broad markets in a recession scenario? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a very big question, and it's been very interesting. I was just in Europe talking to investors as well, and you know, my personal view here is is gold is well set up. We're just talking about that specifically to start, and you know, this environment, and you look at now the uh, Federal Reserve and and all the global banks and all the issues going on around the world with you know kind of negative interest rates, real rates, and that they're kind of stuck in the spot where they really do need to increase interest rates. Uh, it's going to put a bit of a break on, I think, some of the the main economy and sectors and, and pull things back a little bit here at some point. But I do think gold is well set up and it's been really nice to see it hang in there, you know, give or take $1,900 an ounce, uh, despite a lot of ups and downs along the way. Um, it could even be a bit stronger. And I, I do believe it's in an upward trend. Uh, it's really hard to predict in the next six to 12 months type thing. But over the next number of years, it does feel like it's extremely well placed. And it's still one of the sectors, you know, whether you talk about the commodity or the equities, it's also very different. I mean, the commodities held up well. The actual businesses are in good shape for balance sheets and cash flow and all that. Costs are rising, of course, but uh, overall, they're in a good place. And, and yet the equities really haven't moved a heck of a lot. So I think it's an exciting time for, for our part of the sector, for sure. And I guess the broader based economies and, and, and commodities, um, I think they still got a long way to run too. There's such a scarcity of things like copper, which I actually love myself personally, and, and certain other um, metals along the way that are so important to the future. And the future is moving in the direction of obviously greening the world, less emissions, You know, trying to do the right thing uh, ESG wise, because it's smart for business now, I think, not, not just a, a tagline anymore. And, and I think we'll see continued pressure on to the upside on those commodities. Um, but I do think we're due for a bit of a pullback here. If, if the central banks get their way and they do increase the interest rates, call it a few half point raises over the next number of quarters here, um, I do think it'll make people pause and pull back. But I, I personally think it'll be a temporary pause. I don't think there's any massive crash coming, although it's hard to predict. Um, I just don't think the governments and economies will, will allow it to be a massive crash. There'll be enough easing and if they do increase rates, it gives them a little more flexibility to do some easing in the future. So I, I think they're both sides of the sector, whether it be base metals or, or precious are really well set up, maybe slightly different timing in terms of their uh, their go forward improvements to their prices. But I think over the midterm here, both of them are in a great place. Yeah, it is a bit tough to get fully sorted on what the scenario is going to be and exactly how it'll play out. But I agree. I think it could be some disconnect on the equity side versus the underlying prices expect that and i think at the end of the day you know while not everybody likes to do it i think cash really provides that optionality and having a good chunk of cash available or available to tap is going to be useful as things play out here because it's as you and i know it's been a bumpy ride since uh, 16 really quite a bumpy ride and uh, things are moving higher and i think the charts show that now with respect to sector valuations 
Christian, talk about for a moment what you think about producer valuations and then also the junior valuations out there that you're seeing. And with these valuations specifically in the junior sector, do these fit into the potential Equinox model as the company cash flows while also consuming mm -hmm. your own balance sheet, Christian, because obviously you guys have production. So there is some consumption of balance sheets. So you're trying to weigh that and you're also looking at valuations, which there are a few things that are still tasty. But what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I still think valuations are pretty compelling in our space. And you look at the GDX, GDXJ versus the, the actual gold price, and there's a massive disconnect. If you look at the graphing of those over the last 10, 20 years, they, they tend to move somewhat together and they do separate on occasion. And right now we're in that kind of period where they'd say the equities have stayed very flat, multiples have stayed lower. I mean, they are up from where they were, give or take, six months ago, uh, for sure. But you know, historically, some of the, the certainly the larger golds would trade on multiples well over one time, sometimes even up to two times. And that's where I guess the royalty and streaming companies are trading these days. But um, right now, you know, to get a one times multiple feels like a real, real goal and stretch goal, which historically hasn't been the case over or decades, you know. And so it feels like the equities are still really well placed. Um, you know, for us, we've seen our price come up a bit over the last six months. But it still is a multiple that you know we're kind of disappointed with, but we also recognize we have some specific circumstances where we're a little bit of a hybrid of a developer and a producer. So I think for us to be wanting that full producer steady state type multiple, maybe it's a little ambitious today, but we're only a year and a half or maybe two at most away from being a pretty steady state, state cash flowing business with uh, you know uh, growth built into the portfolio. So. I do think that right now, generally across the board, multiples are a bit depressed uh, compared to historic norms. They are coming up slightly, and I still think they have a ways to go. You guys got a lot on the plate. There's been an M&A strategy. There's been development strategy. There's been production strategy. Not a lot of the mid-tiers in your guys' area have been aggressive as much as you have in the last few years. But uh, to some degree, it's what's happening in the market is, is positive for that positioning, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, Christian, let's dive into Equinox here. How about just a quick update for the audience on the capital structure, cash on hand, the status of debt, shares outstanding, and then also, you know, some of the major shareholders you want to highlight at this point. You know, we, as you said, we've really built this company on M&A over the last few years. And I'd say now we've taken a pause and really we're looking inward at the moment. So a little bit more steady state, you know, you probably see things uh, um, focus on really getting our house in order and building our own assets rather than out buying things. And. At the moment, we have, uh, you know, I think it's about 330 million shares or so outstanding. Um, you know, market cap now well over 3 billion Canadian. Um, and then uh, in terms of the balance sheet, we have a $500 million revolving and amortizing credit facility, which we've drawn about 300 million of, so about 200 million available. Um, that's a facility we put in place uh, several years ago when this company was half the size it is today. So actually our banking group, um, we've had a lot of people knocking on the door saying, hey, you should actually mature that structure to something that's got a little bit longer tenor to it, um, a little more reflective of the mature state of the company. So that's something we'll probably look at this year. And then we have 300 million of cash, although we are spending some of that with uh, the build of Greenstone in Ontario at the moment and just to ramp up with Santa Luz. So we've had a lot of um, construction capital being spent. And then the other part of the balance sheet that we do like to consider is we've got almost half a billion dollars of investments, which are um, mainly in Solaris, which is about 300 million of that, and I-80, which is about 150 to 200 million of that. And then we have a couple other smaller ones, um, which make up almost half a billion dollars. So if you think of our cash and our available credit, plus our investments, there's almost a billion dollars of, call it near-term type of liquidity in that balance sheet position. And then we're cash flowing, you know, we're producing six to 700,000 ounces of gold at the moment at a little bit elevated cost today for specific reasons like Los Filos, which uh, over time we plan to get down into a better cost position and the ramping up of some lower cost mines like Santa Luz and eventually Greenstone. So um, at the moment, you know, you've got a nice margin at $1,900 an ounce of probably six, $700 an ounce uh, in margin. And that goes towards building out our mines and, you know, paying for the capital, which is what we're doing at the moment. And I think growth has been something that's been neglected in our sector for quite a few years, partly just because the capital and access to it has not been there. And, you know, we made a conscious effort five years ago or four years ago, I guess now, to gather assets, put growth into the portfolio, be ready to execute on it. And we do think that it will be important as we move forward. And so we're well positioned. And I think we've uh, jumped a little ahead of the curve on that front. 
Yeah, it's compelling the valuation of the company based on what you said there. And well done with I-80 and Solaris. Thank you. Yeah, as you and I, we felt the pain, uh, certainly with respect to the economic, the escalations in price we've seen due to inflation. I mean, that's certainly showing up, I'm sure, in the construction builds and then also just operating costs across the board. You covered a little bit of the expectations on 2022 production, but let's jump into the last time we spoke here, which was last fall. You guys had the groundbreaking ceremony for construction at Greenstone, Ontario, Canada. Can you tell uh, a little bit about where you guys are and what you expect to complete this year at that project? Yeah, so the construction is well underway there and actually heading out there in two weeks' time for sort of the quarterly update. But, you know, the winter we had plans and ambitions really to clear ground, get ready for the plant construction, get the tailings dam advanced in the winter, do some creek diversions, um, order as many things as possible because they have longer lead times nowadays than they used to historically and um, get our camp built and really hire the workforce. And all that's been going pretty well. We've been very pleased with uh, the efforts during the winter. It's cold there in that part of Ontario. So certain things don't get done. Like there's a lot less co concrete poured in the middle of winter. So I'd say right now, as we speak, they're doing a lot of that work so that we'll have plant foundations ready to go in the summer. So you're erecting some of the steel and some of the buildings so that next winter you're working indoors more. Um, you know, your tailings dam, it's actually a little ahead of schedule at the moment, which is nice to see because uh, those are the kinds of areas where you, you can get a little bit of surprises and, and more earthworks than expected in the civil side of things as well. And so far, I call it no major surprises, a little bit extra hard rock, I think, in, in some of the plant site area, which we had to do a little bit more drill and blast, but that's, uh, you know, we're past that point now. And, you know, we factored in when we came out with that um, announcement in October, you know, an extra 20% in the capital when we announced the initial budget for this uh, beyond the feasibility budget. And that in factored in inflation, cost escalations, um, currency, and just a larger contingency to be a little more prudent, 14% you know, contingency. So we hope we've captured all the things we need to. We've given it a good two years to build this mine, which is longer than a lot of mines. Um, you know, it is a big property, so it probably has a little extra work uh, to be on there and it's a little bit of an extended period, but we should be up and running in sort of the first half of 2024. Great. Well, looking forward to seeing that progress and definitely a cornerstone asset. A few weeks ago, you announced a first gold pour at the new Santa Luz mine. Now you've got uh, a C4 producing mines in Brazil. Tell us about Santa Luz here and how things are going in Brazil. Yeah, so Santa Luz, we started 15 months ago or whatever. It's $100 million of capital and, and basically have brought that in on time and on budget, which is great to see. You know, it was right at the wire and poured gold. And right now we're in the middle of that ramp up, sort of knocking out the kinks that are in the system. But uh, actually the, the really pleasing part to that one, because it's a resin and leach plant, it's a slightly different technology than carbon and leach and carbon and pulp. And it basically, um, you know, has carbonaceous ore. So it, it is slightly harder to extract the gold. And this technology has been used in certain parts of the world. And, and we had a team that actually had experience in that. And, you know, looking at this ore, you know, that was the right type of technology. So the plant was adapted. That's why you're only spending hundred million. There was a nice, you know, basically site set up already to, ready to go there. We just had to adapt the technology. And, um, you know, it's been uh, already pouring gold and, and one great thing to see is the actual recovery seemed to be in the early days, right around that level we expected in that sort of mid to low 80s, um, where historically they've been challenged with recoveries because they had the wrong technology there. So that's really exciting for us. And now it's just really getting the throughput in the mill and the plant so that we're up to sort of capacity. But, you know, these mines usually take two or three months to get fully up to speed. And um, that's basically what we're on track to do here in the second quarter. So really pleased the team did a great job on that. Obviously, some of the experience at Arizona was helpful because um, we used some of the senior leadership there and, and learned some lessons on working up in the north there of Brazil. And Bahia is probably slightly easier because of the geography there and, and the weather. And, um, you know, they brought it down on, on time and on budget. So that's off the races. And I'd say we've got our, our four sites in Brazil. Um, you know, it's been a particularly rainy year in Brazil, and, and we really do, this is where you go back to the ESG, really do feel the effects, I think, of climate change, and whether it's be California colder in the winter and a little windier and rainier, or, or a bit more rain in Brazil, or, or you end up with droughts in certain areas, you just have to be better, ready for these slightly less obvious events, and they tend to last longer and, and be a little bit more harsh when they happen, and, you know, that's what we're seeing in Brazil this year, is more rain particularly. It's great to see this come on and yet another one under the belt. My suspicion is you guys are getting certainly better at this. 
So well done there. And key things in Brazil there with obviously the ESG component. And I guess let's maybe we'll skip to that and then we'll come back here just to mix it up. You and I've probably me more stubbornly have come to the realization that ESG is, you know, continually increasingly important to investors and it's making its way into a lot more institutions and platforms and apps and, and all these things that retail and both institutions are seeing and so forth. This is increasingly important. What are you guys doing on ESG and what are your priorities on that? I really changed, I'm going to say changed my tune over the last two years because I really didn't want to see it. And then some of our investors were saying the same thing. Don't make it a window dressing exercise where you're kind of ticking some boxes and putting nice pictures in a, in a brochure because that isn't really what it's about. It's actually about improving our business, which impacts all stakeholders, but also hopefully reduces our costs and, and makes us more efficient and, and makes a lighter touch on the planet. So. I think we're seeing that happening and, and part of it's a push and part of it's a pull. Um, you have investors and call it the capital markets, whether it be the debt capital markets or the, the equity, looking for a focus on ESG and the cost of capital, I believe, is going up or will be going up if you aren't focused on ESG to some extent and doing the right thing. And then on the other side of it, you've got local communities and um, groups and, and impacts that you're making locally that, that are requiring it. And also technology is changing where I would say things are becoming more economic. And one good example is uh, we've had a lot of pitches on changing the energy sources at our, uh, our plant sites. And Brazil is one example where there's some tax subsidies, there's some groups out of Europe and other places that are pitching ideas to move to wind and solar power, which will basically be fed onto the grid, but we get a special benefit for for basically buying into that new energy source and we'll save, you know, could be up to $10 million a year. We'll have a nice clean energy source. We'll be moving, you know, the power supply in the right direction there and it'll tick all the boxes and be better for our business and be potentially cheaper. So that's the kind of thing I love to see, um, you know, and our big emissions, you know, carbon emissions are obviously critical and that's something that we're examining this year. How and when can we commit to something that's kind of net zero or neutral long term and, and what's the right plan to do that we're a bit behind others because we are a newer company but um you know the key elements of carbon emissions really come from your plant site which i already mentioned so we're working on that already but also from your diesel trucks particularly those are the probably you know 80 to 90 percent of your emissions come from those two sources and the trucks seem easy because you know cat and Kamatsu are going to solve that they're going to have electric trucks here or battery powered at some point uh, the question will be how do you get that you know, large enough batteries or electricity to site and all the infrastructure and grid. And that's when you go back to the base metals and copper. Is there enough copper out there to string the lines and have that power coming to site? Because it can be a big demand. And so I think the, the provincial state type power companies are going to be under pressure to supply, I think, groups like ours. So the trucks might be available, but can you get the power? So I think that's a plan that's a little bit longer term, but I think it's kind of clear where that has to head. Um, and those are the big things that we're doing. I mean, the, the smaller things, and again, they're not small, but you know, each site has particular needs in that. Uh, water is becoming a massive you know, issue, whether you have too much or too little. And I think all of our sites have to be more efficient in how they use the water. So we're looking to recycle as much for the plant as possible. Um, we put in new water treatment systems at, uh, certainly in Brazil at one of the sites, we just inaugurated that at uh, Arizona. We're in the process of trying to get one in in uh, Los Filos to upgrade their system. And, you know, so water is gonna be a huge, huge topic as we move forward here. And I think you're likely to see droughts and some excessive periods of rain, and we've got to be able to manage both sides of that equation. Lots to chew off, Christian. You guys are yeah. got lots of things to do across the board here, but yeah, I think those are some good areas that are going to be significant uh, concerns going forward, and definitely it's good to see the ESG, I guess, develop at the company level, at the free market level, and not to have too much government pressure on this. I think it makes more sense to try to do it internally without government pressures. Um, well, it gets more traction, important. it gets more buy-in, it, it's real when, when it's coming from the ground up and, you know, the, when investors are demanding it, not governments only, because I think that's, you know, capital will drive behavior. Yes. How about, let's uh, switch gears here and go over and talk about, you guys have divested the Mercedes mine, which came in through uh, the Premier acquisition, a uh, pretty good little flip there, Christian, if you don't mind me saying that, but uh, any other divestment uh, goals at this point? Or are you guys uh, looking pretty good for a while? Or is there something out there that you guys are looking to divest at a good price? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. We sort of stopped buying, then we decided let's sell Pilar and then Mercedes. We've almost closed Mercedes, just waiting for the final regulatory approvals, which may be as early as this week. Um, and then that'll be officially closed. 
Um, the other things that come up, you know, eventually as Greenstone comes online, maybe there's a small mine in the portfolio sell, but there's nothing imminent right now. But we do have a small royalty portfolio, so maybe we do sell that or spin it out or something because you're seeing multiples in the royalty space, obviously much higher than what we get. Um, we've been good at creating value through spinouts historically at I-80 and Solaris. We've also got some Red Lake assets, which to be honest, I bet you if I asked uh, most people out there, they wouldn't be able to name what we own in Red Lake, but we have Hasaga and Rahel Bonanza. Rahel Bonanza is a joint venture with Evolution, so ideally one day that should probably be part of a, a complex. And then um, Hasaga on its own could be three quarters of a million to a million ounces at eight grams a ton underground. And that's a pretty interesting starting deposit there in Red Lake. And Red Lake's got a lot of attention, particularly after the Great Bear deal. Um, so again, that could be a candidate for a spin out or something too, but it's early days on that. And kind of stepping back, if you don't mind me indulging on this piece, is that when we bought Premier a year ago, I think we paid give or take 550 million for it. Um, we got a collection of assets. Uh, Greenstone, the 60% piece was our critical focus, I think, at that time in that portfolio. But when you think about it, we've sold uh, Mercedes for give or take $150 million. We've uh, got a stake in I-80 of 150, maybe sometimes it touches closer to $200 million. Um, we've got those two assets in a red lake. We've got a, a, some royalties. And when you deduct all that value, you kind of go, how much did we pay for Greenstone? That's the piece that we're really keen on keeping long term. And um, it gets not not to zero, but it gets uh, down well below 200 million. And you know, at the end of the day, it may be below 100 million that we ultimately paid for that 60% stake in Greenstone. And so we think, you know, having the fourth largest mine in Canada when it's up and running, and having paid very little for a big stake in it, is going to be one of the best deals we've ever done. And, and right now, I think we're being penalized for it just because it's got a big capital spend and. You know, right now, uh, Ontario projects have struggled to be up and running on time and on budget. And so we want to buck that trend and uh, over the next 18 months to two years show that that's going to be a world class mine in Ontario. And you can't be in a much better place than that and producing 400,000 ounces in Ontario. Um, when you compare it to, let's say, Pretium was just sold at a similar sort of scale of production, actually less, was just sold for three and a half billion dollars. And so uh, we think we've got one of those tigers in our portfolio. Pretty good tactics, and I think you guys have done a nice job on planning with that. And and again, the question may be posed later, you know, how'd you get Greenstone for free, essentially? And I think there's some good upside left, so maybe it is free at some point. You know, what are your thoughts at this point with a U.S. jurisdiction? You know, let's go outside of California. You don't have to mention that, but you know, U.S. in general, maybe Alaska could be thrown in there. And then what are your thoughts on B.C. at this point? We like the U.S. and, and Canada for sure. I mean, we'd love to add assets. Um, you know, California is quite a, a distinct part of the U.S. And, and we're happy being there. We've got two operating mines and amending, expanding, kind of changing permitting there. It's been, I wouldn't say it's no problem or easy, but it's it's been doable. And it isn't these extended timelines of permitting a greenfield site. It's really amending a brownfield site. So we've been pretty happy with that. And I'd say timelines for permitting, I'd call them slightly extended under the current government. Uh, but we're getting good feedback on our phase two permitting amendment for Castle Mountain. And we just submitted that in mid-March. And the initial feedback is, you know what, you may not need a full EIS. Maybe you need a, an amendment to your plan of operation. That would be a heck of a great result. And maybe that's a two-year amendment process instead of a three-year EIS. And, you know, I wouldn't necessarily count on that, but there's a possibility and we're prepared for both, uh, both tracks. And, you know, that's the kind of environment I think we're in. And, um, you know, I think the rest of the U.S., we'd be happy to be an investor in, I call it the Western U.S. You know, that's clearly where most of the mining is. And having a stake of 26% in I-80, which has all Nevada assets, is, is a great position to be in. And, you know, we're happy to be there. And a couple other states would probably be fine. Um, Alaska, if you're specifically asking about that, I, I'm only got one experience, you know, firsthand in Alaska. And I'm on the board of another company, and it's a more challenging environment. And I don't think it's because of Alaska. I think it's just because of the the actual political football that the, that company and situation is. Um, I think Alaska is fine, and there's very supportive government and and actually local community support there for mining generally, and they get it. So I think Alaska is a fine jurisdiction. I think uh, you want to be careful when you've uh, got something that's a bit of a political football or, or NGO focus um, in your portfolio for sure. And um, you know, Canada, I, I do like Ontario particularly. I find it's Ontario and Quebec by far are probably the best. I think BC is fine. And I actually think the current government's doing a reasonable job. Um, I'd say it feels a little bit slower and 
uh, to get things permitted here in BC and that, but uh, you're still seeing mines move forward. Artemis is moving Blackwater forward. Um, you know, it's, it's not moving quickly, but it's still moving uh, decently well. And there's a lot of mining history here in BC, and I don't think that's going to change any day soon. And with the current commodity prices, I think the, the governments out here in the West particularly realize that there is an important piece to their their future is actually resource extraction in a very uh, sustainable, possible way. And I think BC has actually uh, done a reasonable job of it. Interesting comment. I certainly agree. A great base in the U.S. is a great place to look and place to operate. Uh, there's a few good states left, if you will, Christian, at least in my mm -hmm. view. I, but nonetheless, yeah, I think North America, as we transition out of this Russia-Ukraine war, people start to gravitate back towards the places like North yep. America and even Australia. Great points. How about exploration for a moment? Talk about that. How do you think that the organic exploration plays into the growth plans? First, generally, exploration has just been, there hasn't been enough of it in our sector generally for the last 10 years because the capital hasn't really been flowing in. And that's part of, and we didn't really touch on the, the smaller junior space, but they're probably pretty weakly valued still despite the, the market uptick in gold and that. But, uh, you know, it'll come and uh, the space will need it eventually because it's a depleting sector and the big players are going to need to replace the resource, resources and reserves. And it, it won't purely be through uh, their own exploration, which historically they haven't always you know, given a lot of attention to or been good at. So I think there will have to be the great bear type deals where you go and find a deposit, take it forward, and eventually it gets bought out. And I think for us, we have enough on our plate where we don't necessarily need to buy exploration, but we will spend, I think it's, you know, give or take 35, $40 million. We've done that over the last couple of years each. And that'll be focused mostly on our shorter life mines, which will be the Mesquites and the Santa Luz, Fazenda District, um, you know, Arizona, which we think will be extended into a very long life mine, you know, less so on Philos and um, Greenstone and Castle because they have very long lives already, but eventually there'll be exploration there as well. So um, we're pleased with that. We'll probably get some news out on the Bahia District, which is Fazenda Santa Luz in the next uh, month or so. And that'll give some indication of what we're seeing in between those two mines. Um, but there's lots of opportunity and, you know, particularly Brazil, I would say, is very underexplored. And there's been a lot of new concessions um, awarded last year by the government. And we got a whole bunch of them in that region. So we've got Arizona and the Facenda Santa Luz districts, we consider them. And there will be lots of exploration attention on those. No, that's an extra good piece, the awarding of additional grounds. I think that's great and, and shows your guys' commitment to doing more there in Brazil. Excited to see you guys put a little bit of work money into that's the That's the cheapest, here. best, you know, accretive move in your, your value. You know, and if you look historically, I think the best way to improve the value of a company, particularly at our stage, is to increase your reserves. And where the cheapest place to get ounces, well, it's likely right beside your current operating mine if you can find them. Um, so that's got to be our primary focus on exploration. Absolutely agreed as you guys continue to produce and consume and want to replace that the best you can and actually grow it. So wrapping up here, catalysts, investors, the audience should be aware of here. Uh, what should they look out for as far as milestones this year that you speak of? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the immediate ones are getting uh, Santa Luz into commercial production here during the next quarter, during this quarter. Um, you know, there'll be some exploration news that'll come out periodically throughout the year. Um, milestone sort of updates on Greenstone, but honestly, boring is better in that space because, you know, basically saying we're on track and on time every quarter or every six months will be great news for that that property. We want to do two site visits, one to Santa Luz and one to Greenstone, probably September, October, um, which will allow the analysts for the first time in two years to visit any of our sites, um, one being a brand new mine and one that'll be our next new mine and, and world-class property. And, um, you know, continuing just to move our business towards that steadier state cash flowing business that you will be when Greenstone's up and running um, over the next sort of 18 months to two years. And so in a way, I call it a little bit boring. You know, there might be the odd spin out or, or deal or something we do, but those are kind of ad hoc and um, you can't predict that necessarily. But so I think in a way, boring is better with our business today. And I've said to people, balance sheet similar to what it was a year ago. That's good news. Um, we're on time on budget on, on properties. That's not exciting, but that's good news. You know, and for us, it's really heads down and we're in that trough phase of kind of show me, I think. And the market probably has given us a bit of a discount because we have a heavy weighting towards, um, we had at least two construction projects on the go being Santa Luz and Greenstone. And 
they want to see that de-risked. So I think we keep moving that forward. And of course, I think the third thing or the second thing that really, you know, maybe has held back our multiple or our stories because we had those Los Velos blockades there uh, since we bought it a couple of times, unfortunately, we seem to be in an operating period here where we're seeing some consistency. Um, we're not quite back to where we want to be on Los Velos yet, but it is operating. It's producing gold. It's becoming more consistent. We're building hopefully a small amount of trust with the community so that you know, over the next year or two, we build the confidence once Greenstone's done to build the CIL plant there because that mine's producing less than 200,000 ounces of gold today. It's disappointing. It should be producing 300,000 ounces plus, and it'll then be a much lower cost, longer life, exciting mine in the portfolio. And once Greenstone's up and running, it'll be a smaller piece of the portfolio, give or take 10 or 15 percent. And that's where we want to see it over the long term, but still a meaningful contributor. Um, so I think, uh, you know, no news again on that front is, is good news. So in a way, a little bit boring, but, um, you know, that's the phase we're in. We made a commitment to actually building out the portfolio and, and doing it well. And we built three mines over the last three years. Um, we got a two year period to build the next mine. But uh, if we can knock that off and have our fourth in a row, that'd be a great result. I think it'll be good to see Los Filos bump up there, and, and I appreciate you expressing the disappointment there, and you guys want to get that going, and hopefully there'll be some good progress this year, Christian, so keep it rolling here. And How about for potential investors, new audience, et cetera, um, all the folks listening in, Equinox stands at about $2.6 billion U.S. dollars. What would you say to those who are listening about the promises of this company and the deliveries going forward? Yeah, I think to make it really simple, I would say, where can you get, you know, a company that's producing almost three quarters of a million ounces of gold with the ability to move it up well above a million ounces of gold in the near term and it's funded to do it. So it's got growth, funding, built in platform and diversification. And we're probably trading at, you know, a multiple that's just significantly discounted to our peers that are call it of a similar scale, but our steady state but we've got a clear path to getting to where they are. And so if you want leverage to gold and you want a potential multiple re-rate, you know, this is a pretty interesting and exciting place to be investing. And some people will want to see Greenstone de-risk before they take that leap and invest in maybe our stock. But I hope that then they have to buy the stock at a higher price. So, uh, you know, as we de-risk along the way, I hope we start to get some credit for it. And so now is a really interesting time and, and there's a, you know, a bunch of stuff that's happening in the company here that whether the gold price goes up or not in the midterm, which I do believe it will, it doesn't really matter. I think what we're doing in the current gold space is going to be interesting and be a potential for a nice re-rate here. And the best way for investors to get in touch with the company? So you can go to our website. There's investor relations uh, contacts there. I mean, you can email us, you can call us. We're very open and accessible. Berlin, myself, and a few other senior management will pick up the phone if you call us and also answer your emails uh, directly as well. And, and if it needs to have a conversation, we're happy to dive into the business because we're pretty passionate about it ourselves. Christian, always a pleasure to chat the natural resource markets and of course the work being progressed at Equinox. Uh, let's do it again soon. I appreciate your time. Great, thanks Andrew, appreciate being here.